born ready. I'm not entirely sure we are ever born ready, but I'll take it. No, no, I know. I was just, I was writing a a newsletter for next week about why I never want to take a TED stage. So you have some thoughts and feelings at the moment. (laughs) It was fun to write it. I enjoyed it. I was like, there's things. I, I think I end with something like sneak peek into next week's newsletter, kids, if you watch it. If you get it, um, I think I end with something like, you know, for everything that we do, I'm pretty much always going to be right next to Dr. Kristen, except when she steps in that red circle, then I'll be backstage holding her bag. <laughs> so, so true. Or in the audience, as you will be in Chicago. Or in the audience. Yeah, I won't be yes. backstage, but in Chicago, I'll be in the audience. Yeah. In Chicago. Yeah, that's like there was I was talking to somebody today about like one of the things that we're different at. And I was like, well, just wait until we figure out all of our Clifton strengths and then we'll be able to articulate this a lot better. But um, <laughs> I am the I am the feather bow aware. That is my job <laughs> in this yes. in this relationship. We both love stages and performances. Yes. You're the only one that likes to be on them. <laughs> Fair. Fair. Uh, I do. I do thrive. Like what is it's that TikTok that's going around. Like I'm a, I, uh, if you surround yourself with things that are like you, I should surround myself with house plants because I'm always perpetually dehydrated and wither without attention. Yes. Yeah. That's not like, thank you. Bye guy or whatever. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. It's that guy. Yeah. All right. Should we get this thing started? Let's go. Let's do this. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday, October the 5th. Hello. Hello, all. Even our beloved Replay crew, podcast folks, whenever you're catching this, we love you. Thank you for joining us today. It's a gorgeous fall day in Pittsburgh. I don't know what it's like in Philly, but it's so nice out. Wouldn't use the word gorgeous for this side of the state, but we're making it work. It's just a little bit dreary, overcast, and still kind of humid. It's Mm. kind of like one of those weird fall days where it manages to be both 65 and 80 percent humidity oh my god that was actually on on sunday it was like soup outside yeah it's weird things are weird on this end of the state yeah. which um i mean it's not that abnormal if i'm completely honest no no and things are weird in the world which they is are. i think my transition into the literal boatload of empathy exercises we have for today <laughs> like i couldn't well, even open them all in the tab like when <laughs> I have to like stage them for anyone who is joining us on the podcast. Know that here on the YouTubes, we're starting something new today in which we figured out how to share our screen. I know my gosh, welcome (laughs) to 2021. And we're going to be putting the empathy exercises up on the screen as well as talking about them. So that's what's going on. If we giggle and if we giggle every once in a while, it's because I did something silly with the tech, but uh, we think this is a good way also to let us read it at the same time, because otherwise we're like looking off in 25 different directions. So this is this is exciting. So first one up um, is an update on something that we've done. Um, I think we did a whole a whole hottish take on it. We did. We did. It is now. Yeah. A hottish take and a podcast episode and a podcast um, episode. Too Long Didn't Read, Uh, the woman pictured here, Sarah Everard, was murdered earlier this year. Yes, in London, Yes, I believe. On the 3rd of March. On the 3rd of March. There we go. Um, Abducted, sorry. Abducted from London, um, murdered in Kent. Uh, It created a whole series of, of protests because she was walking home alone and the Metropolitan Police just stepped in it like 8 billion times, which they continued to do even last week. Um, in, in short, making the argument that it is the woman's responsibility to ensure her safety when she's out in public or other marginalized folks, but specifically in this case was talking about young women out and about. Um, we found out that Sarah was, uh, abducted and mur- raped and murdered by a serving metropolitan police officer. His trial was last week, which is why it's back on our empathy exercises updates. 
Wayne Cousins was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Um, we learned a lot of details about the case during his like three day sentencing hearing that were exceptionally upsetting, including the fact that he used his status as a serving police officer to arrest her under false pretenses for allegedly violating COVID protocols. And that was how he got her into his car. Um, to wit, the Metropolitan Police, uh, the second part of our empathy exercise uh, for this is the Metropolitan Police announced after that little tidbit was made uh, apparent in the sentencing hearing that if women in London or anywhere where the you know UK police serves, feel unsafe when confronted by a police officer, they should flag down a bus or a taxi. Lol, JK. At what point is it resisting arrest? And what do we do when it's a person of color? And are they actually having a laugh? Like, this is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. For anybody, I scrolled a little bit earlier for anybody joining us on the YouTube. This is uh, Cressida Dick, who is the Metropolitan Police Commissioner currently. And um, who... I honestly don't know has thought about life outside of the metropolitan police in a long time. Cause all of her statements on this have been a little bit from my, per from my perspective, just a little bit shocking in how she doesn't seem to understand how the world works. How the world works. Yeah. I mean, I just have to love that her name is Cressida Dick. Cause Cressida is one of the most British names you could have as a woman and then the fact that her surname is dick um but yeah obviously that unleashed a whole new set of protests from women um and you know as soon as the met uh releases their handy laminated wallet sized guide on how i am supposed to tell whether a police officer is being genuine or not Can't i'll let wait you to guys know and i'll and i'll feel super safe again um so yeah, if you want more on this conversation, hit up our podcast, hit up the hot-ish takes. We have some real righteous anger about male violence against women and that the onus is always put on women to ensure that we are not abducted, raped, strangled, set on fire, which is what happened to Sarah Everard and just needs to be said out loud a little bit more till I feel better. Yeah, which will be sometime probably in 2025. Sometime um, probably never. Speaking of things that are terrible, <laughs> we'd also like to talk to you about Madagascar, <laughs> which is currently experiencing the world's first climate change induced famine. In that a fun statement? This Ooh. comes to us from one of our favorite Instagram accounts called Impact, where they spend a lot of time making sure that folks like us and you know what's going on in the world. So... Southern Madagascar has been in a drought for four years. This mm. is the first, the worst drought in 40 years. For anyone who doesn't know, Madagascar is an island off the bottom of Africa, really, like off the southeastern coast. You may know it because it is also a series of DreamWorks movies, but it's a real <laughs> country, we promise. Um, and the annual oh, rainfall people. has been at an all-time low. It causes a shortage of water for irrigation. The lack of supply has completely dismantled farming and agricultural production. Completely dismantled. There has only been one successful crop harvest in the last five years. Around 30,000 people are experiencing extreme levels of food insecurity and over a million people lack sufficient access to food. This is disproportionately affecting women and children, especially pregnant women. And although Madagascar is responsible for only 0.1% of the global carbon emission, is it, it is experiencing the worst climate change. If we don't act, it's a major issue. We're going to have links in the bio here to what, to what Impact recommends. The World Food Program has a specific uh, thing right now to donate directly to Madagascar, as well as an organization called Action Against Hunger. Um, that is in general. But then also, please know that any, um, I think, any climate change charity worth their salt is also worth some of your cash right now. Um, but yeah. yeah, we wanted to highlight Madagascar because it's definitely not a country that anyone talks about. So um, some really nasty things happening in Madagascar. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that we learned a lot on our colonizers world tour 
with stops in beautiful places like Fiji and Papua New Guinea and uh, the like is that statistically, the places that produce the least amount of climate change occurring fuels and carbon emissions and all that stuff are the ones disproportionately affected by it. So yeah. it's all these tiny island nations around the world that are literally disappearing. And a, a lot of indigenous folks around the world are exceptionally environmentally conscious and have been working to combat climate change and they are feeling disproportionately the negative impacts of it. So I was not surprised to see this in Madagascar. I was not either, but was also at the same time shocked that I hadn't heard anything heard about anything it. anything about so. it. I know. Shocking. Speaking of things I haven't heard about, you brought this one to my attention. Go. This, the gentleman on the state, on the screen right now is North Carolina Courage's head coach, Paul Riley. North Carolina Courage is a team in the National Women's Soccer League. And Paul Riley, evidently for many years, has been known as a sexual predator within the league. Um, and the people brought these allegations to the league's attention. And it was not, according to Megan Rapino, Alex Morgan, and literally everyone I've read on the internet, handled appropriately. Um, he's been in, he's been accused of sexual coercion for the last 11 years across various teams within the league. And even though the courage is, I should say he's the former head coach because the courage yeah. terminated him. Um, but like the league knew there's some mm -hmm. really clear receipts that the league knew we're going to be um, putting up additional links that we've seen yeah. on Twitter. Alex Morgan made a statement, some other folks within the show notes so that you can go on as deep of a deep dive as we did here. Um, but obviously we would like to say that institutions will always protect itself. So the hand wringing we're getting now from the NSWL is um, a little bit, we're side eyeing it a little bit because 11 years is a really long time to hide something in a league as small as the NWSL. And I, I'm I struggle to believe that this, I struggle to believe that this is what it was, it took to make women safe in a league that is entirely supposedly built on women's athletic ability. Uh, so this is particularly grievous from our perspective. We are mm -hmm. glad that he is no longer employed. We are currently skeptical that the league has done anything to make sure this kind of thing won't happen again. Because the, the news that came out today, and again, the link will be in the show notes, was that this is the third coach or the third person oh, in a position. I, yeah, that was like the news today. Um, thank you, the skim. Um, it's definitely in the link in our uh, Trello card. So it'll show up in the show notes that Great. there's been at least three administrative yeah. level men working in the NWSL um, that have been accused of misconduct and abuse from bullying to like the, your man here, like coerced one of the players into having sex in the hotel room. So runs the gamut of abuse and assault. I didn't freeze on screen. My face froze in shock. Okay. <laughs> So yeah. after all of that, all of that heaviness, we do have a breath of fresh air for you guys. I know. We do have we some are going, happy ones. We would love to introduce you to Jesse Bascal, pictured here. Nola Rolla. Who has made the Nola Rolla Guide, which is a guide for accessibility and tourists and locals in the city of New Orleans. This is amazing. We love it. Super excited. Just going to scroll down here. There's Jesse. Hey, friend. Hi, Jesse. Thanks so much. And uh, this is a great write-up in the very local New Orleans uh, website. And we will be linking to it as well. And I'll be honest, going to be really excited to um, give custom to some of these places as able-bodied folks to support their, their focus on wheelchair accessibility. We love making sure that we're doing that. So we're planning a trip to New Orleans in the next couple of years, um, just either for funsies or trying to find somebody who'll pay us to go, <laughs> keep you guys posted. Yep. Uh, and we will make sure to save this article for a list of where we should go when we head there. We're very excited. For reals. Okay, so you got your breath of fresh air. Are you guys ready? We're going back to depressing shit. Here we go. 
Here we go. Ignore the fact that I haven't paid my subscription to the New York Times yet. And please focus on the top, which is something that Dr. Aaron found. So I'm going to let her talk about it. But the headline says more than one half, more than half of police killings are mislabeled. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, read from this a little bit. Um, this is a new, re new research that tells us that police killings in America have been undercounted by more than half over the past four decades, according to a new study that raised questions about racial bias amongst medical examiners and highlights the lack of reliable national record keeping on what has become a major public health and civil rights issue. The study was done by the University of Washington and published last week in The Lancet. So, I mean, this isn't new news to a lot of us that have been following ongoing civil rights protests for police accountability, police brutality, police reform, all of all said uh, things. Um, so if you have the New York Times subscription or you find the, our, the information else, elsewhere, take a look at the stats to back up what we all know. Um, and, you know, we talk about all the time uh, here at every research what what systemic means what it means when something is systemic systemic racism means that it is everywhere so it's not just the police it's the biases that exist about black and brown folks in all parts of society including medical examinations including court cases and all of these things and it's a whole conspiracy of biases that work together to keep supporting that systemic racism, that institutionalized racism. But everything's great. Everything is great because next up is something hilarious that I found uh, coming to you from your Indian country correspondent. Um, was delighted to see that Comedy Central has partnered with uh, a Native American animator who's Joey Tainment. He's tagged here, Joey. Cliff. Clift. Yeah. Um, to create this fantastic video about uh, So You're Upset about Native American mascots being changed. Uh, obviously, Comedy Central has done tongue in cheek and points out how we can all change our patterns and behaviors uh, around these changing mascots so that we're not being so offensive. But I encourage you to watch it. I encourage you to share it. It's a fun way to start this conversation hopefully and get people laughing about it if nothing else. Yeah. And another way to start a conversation as we always talk is when representation shows up in different ways. And so this week on, or last week on the drag race season that's happening in the UK, um, Dr. Aaron found this one as well, but as she's scribbling timestamps, I will say that um, as your um, body positivity correspondent, I yes. was very happy to see this. There was evidently a, mar a remark made at a queen about the queen's body size. And that queen came back and said that that was came back at the teaser and said that was really inappropriate. And this article doesn't cover a whole lot. And I've had trouble finding the episode because we're not in the UK and Drag Race UK for this season hasn't showed up on our Amazon Prime yet. Uh, but I look forward to watching this and seeing this conversation because what is reported is that it was a powerful chat about different people's bodies and how it works. And of course, um, there is there is the the queen in question. And her tweet says, I love every curve, lump, bump, stretch mark, scar and discoloration. Without this beautiful vessel, I wouldn't be standing here where I am today. And there's lots of conversations also to be had about drag and bodies and women's bodies versus men's bodies and how we are presented differently at different times and, and things like that. And I always want to have those conversations, but I'm really proud that Victoria Scone went ahead and clapped back because I will yeah. as somebody who constantly chooses not to, it's because it's exhausting. So good job. <gasps> good job. Um, ooh, ready for this transition? This one just came to me, Aaron. Speaking of things we should all clap back at. Oh, oh my days. Oh, you're so good at this. Yeah, um, I found this one. I don't really need to go into too, too much detail about it because we spend an inordinate amount of time on our on our various recording devices talking about abuse scandals. Um, and so the French Catholic Church uh, has done a, a study, had had a commission done, um, and they found estimated 3,000 pedophiles 
in the Catholic French Catholic Church since the 1950s. This is, of course, a problem that has plagued the Catholic Church in the United States, in the UK, in Canada, and the Catholic Church at large. Um, so the, the commission hasn't released its report yet. Uh, so we'll see what comes of it and the changes that will hopefully come to the French Catholic Church to protect its members and participants from abuse. We won't hold our breaths, to be completely honest. Um, but hey, guys, we're trying to do breaths of fresh air for you in the midst of all of this. <laughs> so this next one is another breath of fresh air. Here you go, Dr. E. This one's from you. Yes. So I was very excited to see this news. Um, and for those of you that aren't aware, um, this uh, story of Bruce's Beach um, is a prime time, like prime beachfront property in Los Angeles County that was taken from the Bruce family in 1924. It has finally been returned to their descendants after a long battle. So uh, this is, you know, one of those cases in which the city... Uh, manipulated its legal standards in order to take land away from people, which institutions and jurisdictions do all the time. Um, and so delighted to see that Bruce's Beach has been returned to the Bruce family. Uh, and we applaud their ongoing effort and hope that they enjoy having their land back. Deeply, deeply hope. So mm -hmm. we've got one more really serious one and then kind of two more things about humans we want to talk about. But this next one we want we want to take a little bit more time with because it's a it's from the eminent journalistic endeavors of BuzzFeed. I'm going to go yeah. ahead and zoom in on this a little bit here because I think it's, it's some important stuff as we scroll. So people are sharing on Reddit and in other places some of the side effects of, of the COVID pandemic that aren't being talked about. And as we have this conversation today, I'm preparing to give a TEDx on Saturday entirely about the things we're not talking about with COVID. So this really hit home to us and we wanted to share it with people. Um, so the a Reddit user started it with what are some of the darker side effects that we're not talking about? One of the first ones here is I'm a pediatrician. We have multiple babies and toddlers brought to the hospital by police for being found alone in the home with the caregiver deceased. Skyrocket in domestic abuse, which has been being called out by a lot of um, advocates since the beginning days of lockdown. Um, a lot of veterinarians and shelters are also saying that they're deeply concerned with people returning pets once they go back to work. There's a lot of shelters that are completely overloaded already um, and veterinarians that can't keep up with all the people with new pets who don't necessarily have any training in new pets. Our tech person, Eleanor, is a pet care specialist and has seen this in her world as well and has, has flagged this with us. Um, we want to read this one in particular. Deaf and partially deaf people are very affected. My mother, who's wearing hearing aids, also depends on reading lips, especially in louder, busier areas, because hearing aids can have trouble sorting through complex noise situations so imagine what's happened now that everybody has covered their faces with masks. Yeah. We also hear that, that, you know, returning to the office is nervous for some hearing and, and partially deaf people because masks, you can read lips on Zoom. And so the Zoom meetings are really great, but you can't read lips once you go back to the office. There's not a, a desire to do that. Um, and then this is one of the ones that hits us the most. My high school students are woefully lacking in terms of behavior and meeting social expectations, they have no idea how to function at school. This group has been affected by the pandemic since grade eight, which is when work habits tend to take form. This is going to take a few years to rebuild. And I'll say on this, our wonderful listener, Jay, has just affirmed that she doesn't hear super well and hearing muffled voices is so hard. Um, and I think that's I know I have become incredibly more aware of my diction while wearing a mask mm -hmm. than I ever was before because I can't, I can't imagine it. So this article goes on and on. We're going to stop the depression here um, <laughs> because those couple ones at least are worth thinking about. And we're going to yeah. link this article in the show notes. We would encourage all of you to sit with some of these just a little bit. And uh, we certainly will be over the next little bit. I'm actually going to make sure that this is shared. This link is shared in our social media when we talk about this TED, because mm. it really does, in fact, illustrate everything I am about to say in four days that once I finish memorizing it. You're so close. It's remarkably prescient and timely. Um, 
especially as you know we have been uh living on the hill we will die on that uh the phrase back to normal is very very damaging and harmful um because we can't ever go back to normal and also you know normal wasn't great for a lot of people so it's not it's not something i think for, we should aspire to go back to so I think also just really with- funny. We're here on my browser, so I just got told that my that my time subscription ran out, and here is the advert to subscribe to the New York Times here on BuzzFeed. Oh, I hate the inter- internet. Internet, thanks for stalking me. I hate the internet. Here you go. Here's something else I don't necessarily hate. I know this was exciting news. It came to uh, my attention today uh, that the family of Henrietta Lacks, their estate, are suing the company who stole her, who have been using her stolen cells. So the company is- I'm Is it at Thermo to... Fisher? Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thermo Fisher Scientific. Um, and they are asking, the lawsuit is asking them to disgorge the full amount of its net profits obtained by commercializing the Gila cell line to the estate of Henrietta Lacks. If you aren't familiar with this story, um, please look into it more. Uh, and there's a great link that we're also going to share in the show notes that our friends at the Daily Skim have done uh, a great resource list uh, and expl- explainer about um, racism in medical science. Um, and so, you know, this is especially prescient now as we're having a lot of Black and Brown folks throughout the pandemic be vaccine hesitant. A lot of it stems from stories like Henrietta Lacks uh, and the abuse and mistreatment of black and brown folks by the medical field. So we will keep a weather eye on this case and we hope it resorts in some whatever whatever victory and justice looks like for her family. Yeah, too long didn't read essentially like she died and they harvested her cells and her family's never made money off of it. Ta-da! Thermo Fisher Scientific is massive, by the way. And um, has made a lot of money off of this. Yeah. Yeah. Harvested herself without her consent, without her family's consent or knowledge. Yeah. Um, you you take medicine that is developed by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Everybody does. So mm-hmm. just be aware of that. Okay. So this is my new favorite news for the week. We're ending on a high. <sighs> Woo. Yes. Netflix realized that it makes a lot of money off of Chadwick Boseman and uh, (laughs) thought that maybe a decent human thing to do would be to establish a scholarship at Howard, especially since uh, part of Chadwick Boseman's living story when he told it is that he got a scholarship to Howard to be able to to go there. And his scholarship was personally paid for by Denzel Washington, which is Mm -hmm. one of my favorite uh, connective tissues of of American history. So Netflix is establishing a $5.4 million scholarship. From my understanding, it's an endowed one, which means it will continue to be in perpetuity and uh, it will be in Chadwick's honor. And I still grieve the loss of Chadwick Boseman to the artistic community and to the human community. Mm -hmm. Him and Robin Williams and Heath Ledger and Philip Seymour Hoffman are the ones that get me whenever I think about them. Um, So I'm really glad to see that other... um, aspiring actors without the resources to afford the incredibly expensive Howard University will have the opportunity to become a Howard alumni with all of the privileges that entails that Mm -hmm. definitely and the training that definitely got Chadwick his start so I'm thrilled to do that and I think it's a really good transition into our main topic for today I know I know I was just thinking that I was like speaking of how we build empathy what what yes it's like we planned it um we're going to spend today talking essentially about art yeah. and what consuming stories and um, engaging with fictional realities in a lot of ways helped us build empathy. So I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Aaron. We both know each other's answers, by the way. <laughs> um, so uh, so uh, please let me pretend I don't know your answer to this question, Dr. Aaron. But tell yeah. us, what is some of the ones that you think about when you think about this question? Yeah, I had so much fun thinking about it today because we talk about this all the time and we have uh, discovered, especially in the last couple of years, a shared love of many films. 
um, whether they were impactful or not. I mean, Ever After is like carved in our souls, but wasn't really necessarily an empathy build for me. Um, but I still remember the day we found out we both like loved that movie and we didn't know that we loved that movie at the same time. Um, but I had a good time thinking about it today because I was like, I have the answers that like Dr. Kristen knows um, that we talk about a lot. But for me, it's really, it can be like big things like Black Panther was a big empathy build for me. But a lot of the ones I thought of were smaller ones where it was it was just not necessarily the piece of art was entirely about a situation, um, but a char- what a character experienced kind of opened my eyes to a different experience for, you know, women or men or disabled folks or, or whatever category of human we're looking at. So honestly, this happened, uh, This I was reminded of this last week when we were in Charleston and I texted Dr. Kristen that one of our favorite 90s movies Save the Last Dance was on. And I forgot that that movie like low key talked about racism and yeah. relationships between um, black men and white women. And Carrie Washington's character is like real honest in it. That was the first time I had ever heard that conversation happen. And I was like, oh, there's all these layers. I had no idea. Um, Center Stage was one of the first times. It's an absolutely ridiculous film. But it was one of the first times I remember seeing a character struggle with an eating disorder. And like that was it was done in a really empathetic way. And then that got me like spiraling down. Like, I wonder if I can think of other things that are less obvious to me. One of my favorite films is a 1995 classic Empire Records. It's a little little gem of a film hardly anyone's ever seen except me. I know every single word. It stars baby Renee Zellweger and uh, Liv Tyler and a couple other folks, Robin Tunney. Uh, but it's a story of all these humans, young young adult humans who work in a record store called Empire Records. And it's like a day in the life. Ridiculous things happen all day. But they're all grappling with adulthood and change and uh, like suicide attempts, taking drugs, parental pressure, um, valuing yourself, all of these kinds of things that like you just watch the movie and you think it's kind of silly. But it showed me that like what we talk about a lot with Abbey Research is that like humans are diverse, whether they look at or not, because they have all of these lived experiences. So. I, I went for some like for some off the radar ones. Obviously, Shawshank Redemption is on the list. A Time to Kill. We've talked about ad nauseum as a friendship. Um, but like that that was the first time I realized that racism wasn't something that died with Jim Crow. Yeah. Like very legitimately. Yeah. It's one of the most formative books of my life. Yeah. No. But I was thinking even today, like the movie Circle of Friends, which is one of my favorites, was the first time I remember um like a, a a film that I was watching talking about abortion. Oh, easily. And for me, yeah. it was the first time I saw a fat girl get love. So that like, for yeah. me, those are two things. Yes. And, and then I got really pissed when I found out that Minnie Driver isn't fat. Not- I was like, gosh, darn it, Minnie. Um, but yeah, not- that was a formative one for me too. Yeah. Uh, well, so that's my, my low key list. Another one that I don't really talk about, but another one that taught me a lot about race, um, especially in education uh, and also the intersection with with income and like urban life and poverty and all that kind of stuff is the 1989 um, Morgan Freeman classic Lean on Me. You know, which I've never seen. I know, but I remember watching it and it's about like he's brought in as a principal of a, of a struggling New Jersey school. Um, as they all are. Yeah. Would have told you for my life it was filmed in Chicago, but I looked it up today and it said New Jersey. I was like, okay, cool. Uh, or set in Chicago. That I think is just my own racial bias that like struggling schools exist in the South side of Chicago because I'm a white lady. Um, but yeah, that one for me, I remember watching it like really close to when it came out and being like, what are these different human experiences? I have no idea. I was thinking as you said about Ever After, that was one of the ones I I remember her quoting Utopia and that being really formative for me. And the idea. So one of the differences in our lives is that our families talk about money differently. 
And so just because of owning a small business versus um, not owning one, my family has had to have a lot of different conversations about money than yours. And one of the things that we've been talking about since I was a kid is what do you do responsibly if you are given a lot of money and a lot of resources? And like her version of Thomas More Utopia has been in the back of my head a lot. Like that, like That's that amazing. confrontation she has where she's like, right, but if, if, they're committing crimes because you made them hungry. Aren't you the one that did it? That's like, Brian and I talk about it all the time here. And my father believes it. He just doesn't know that this comes from utopia, but mm -hmm. we've never done a layoff here at Abbey Color ever because our yeah. belief is that if we have to financially lay somebody off, it's been our screw up. Yeah. And that was the first movie where I connected that that wasn't just my dad's crazy idea. <laughs> <laughs> that came from other people. So I make that argument a lot with people. I'm like, well, if, yeah. if, you have to fire them because of a decision that they made and you didn't do it right as a leader. Aren't you the one that hired them and then fired them without their consent? So Amazing. ever after still even that way for me. Yes. Um, I yeah. love that. I love that you found an empathy build from ever after. Of course I did. One of the biggest ones for me too. And I was thinking like beyond, I mean, time to kill and to kill a mockingbird are the ones that we say all the time. All the time. I think if if I did ever have a child, I would have named him Atticus. Shout out to our friend Carrie the Librarian, who in what fact what? did did just that. <laughs> um, but one of mine is Angels in the Outfield. It's the first time I saw foster care um, and oh. thought ever what foster care was like. And for years, even when I got into social work school, I didn't know anybody else in foster care. And yeah. so when I got into social work school and we were talking about foster care, I remember very, very vividly just saying, I need somebody to explain to me in the terms of Angels in the Outfield. <laughs> Have you seen Angels of the Outfield? Can you use it as a reference point? Thank you. It is actually what, what Danny Glover did legal in Angels of the Outfield. Um, but very, it's still, I don't have a lot of personal interactions with folks who are in foster care just for a host yeah, of reasons. And sure. so that's that was a big one for me. Um, and I remember my brother and I talking about that after we saw it and my parents being like, do you guys understand that they weren't Maggie's children? Like, do you understand... Um, what that looked like. And we were like, no, what do you mean? <laughs> Our what little privilege mean? bubbles. <laughs> I know. Oh my gosh. That's so good. I love that. Yeah. Anything I else? mean, Disney movies are like, honestly, like we can mock them up the wazoo. And there are things like the, the counter side to this conversation is the art that I consumed that was really damaging. Oh, and, for sure. and so like every single time, I mean, and we can, all of it for me, most of it for me is body image issues. All of it right. for me has to do with body and love and believing yeah. that people that looked like me didn't get love. Right. But on the up, like Disney was, Angels, I still, Angels in the Outfield's a great, a great movie about faith. I think that Remember the Titans stands up um, as saccharine as it is. Obviously, Miracle is in our pantheon. So, and there's lots of things in that. Um but when I was young, I, I think Angels in the Outfield was one of the ones that I would have put up there. I remember seeing Dangerous Minds far too young as well. Oh, same. Me too. But living near Philly and work, like having Abby here meant I knew that that's what schools were like. So it wasn't yeah. like an empathy build, but I saw that thing way too young to yeah. really understand what it was. List of movies I saw way too young. Dead Poet Society. Definitely. I remember. I just remember this. Um, was probably one of my first empathy builds about suicide. Mm. Um, so I think yeah. I probably saw that way too young. Dangerous Minds, way too young. Oh, there was another one I had just thought of, but it's gone out of my head where I was like- I was in third grade thing. when I went to a sleepover and we watched Grease and they had to explain that Rizzo got an abortion. That was, I was in third yeah. grade for that one. Yeah, I must have seen Grease early, but for some reason- like, but Circle of Friends is the first one that stuck because like Dirty Dancing is I saw that right around the same time. Oh, so yeah. for me, Dirty Dancing is the first one where I realized that that that's what happened was that there I was... definitely I went through my 80s movie love phase mm -hmm. talk about damaging like high films of John Hughes. Um, um, but I went through that phase after Circle of Friends. Fair. And I came to Circle of Friends after I came to Dirty Dancing. And so. Yeah. That's but like Dirty Dancing is also damaging for me because of what Jennifer Grey looks like and the and the dancing scene that there's no one that ever looks like me in those movies. So yeah. for sure, um, it, well, I saw if I had seen Hairspray when I was little, that would have been a really big empathy build. Such a um, and I still John Waters is a nutcase, but I still stand by his work. I love I love John Waters so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. And a big one for me in terms of empathy building too is theater. Yeah, obviously. I saw Miss Saigon um, when I was in seventh grade and I know now all of the problems with it. And I understand the Asian American community's hatred of that musical. And I respect that completely, but I, no joke. That was the first time it ever occurred to me that Americans killed humans in the Vietnam war mm. and not like video game characters. Yeah. Um, yeah. The song still, the song that opens the second act, which is um, they are the living reminders of all the good we failed to do. That line is the is this about the Budong, which is the children of Vietnamese women and American soldiers. That line still, whenever someone talks about the Vietnam War, that's the line that comes to mind. Yeah, and I saw yeah. that in seventh grade with my grandma, who bless my grandma, had no idea what she was taking me to. <laughs> no idea whatsoever. If anyone has seen Miss Saigon, it opens in um in an exotic dancing thing miss saigon is the title of like a fake beauty pageant that they have uh -huh. so uh -huh. my incredibly like not just politically or religiously but culturally conservative grandma yeah. just very calmly took off her glasses because we were in the <laughs> third row <laughs> as these very talented dancers are shaking their asses in her face best just like took off her glasses and said let let me know when they're clothed it was like the most <laughs> But it was like, she didn't, oh, she didn't shame me for wanting to see it. Like she didn't, yeah. it was still this very like generosity of how we do, of how we also consume art we don't agree with. She just took off her glasses. She didn't make a stink about it. She doesn't want to see that. Right. Um, so I love that. But, but Miss Saigon is one of the more important theater moments of my life, which is why I defend right. the musical, even though I understand its problems. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, my mom absolutely loves the music from South Pacific. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And right so around the same I age remember, like, I remember watching that when I was pretty young, and that was pretty formative in terms of understanding, like, the complexities, both of, like, American involvement um, in foreign places, but also racism as well. Um, and bias that existed. So yeah, I mean, I think you guys can tell from our conversation, right, that like anything can be an empathy build. And that was kind of why we thought this conversation would be a good one, because a lot of people think it can be inaccessible or that you have to watch serious things, serious things in inverted commas. Um, and we watch a lot of those these days uh, in our adult life. Um, and we learn about a lot of things through them and a lot of different human experiences. Um, but if you actively and intentionally seek out diverse storytelling, those are empathy builds. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we watched a great Hallmark. Was it Hallmark or Lifetime with Ali Stroker from last year? Lifetime. Al it was Lifetime. Great, yeah, it was a great uh, Lifetime movie um, with Broadway sensation Ali Stroker. Um, who is wheelchair bound. She won a Tony for Oklahoma. Yes. Yes. Oklahoma. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then we saw her in a Chipotle. It was very exciting for us. We did see her in a Chipotle. That is very true on 8th Avenue. We see so much happens on 8th Avenue. Um, but yeah, I mean, that wasn't a good empathy build for us. And it was a lifetime Christmas movie. So, you know, Anytime you engage with a story that tells you something different about humans and human experience in a way that is done respectfully. I mean, I think one of the things that I thought of when I was thinking about Empire Records was it tells all these stories and it doesn't judge the people for them. That's the other thing. Like if it's a if it's a movie where it's judging a human experience uh, in a way that is, you know, shameful or whatever, that might not be the best Depends on the experience, obviously. Um, if it's judging serial killers, we have lines. Um, but I think and actually, not enough movies about serial killers judge the serial killer. Exactly, and that's a conversation about women in true crime that we can have at another day. We're going to. We're going to. Doctor Kristen is obsessed with true crime. Yeah, and, and I'm also obsessed with the fact that you all know who Ted Bundy is, and you don't know the names of his victims. Yeah, yeah. So we can have. We could, even though I am not obsessed with true crime, I can have a, a pretty long conversation about the way we cover uh, serial killers or crime, true crime. Yeah. And gender. Yeah. 
Everything. Which is a great transition here in that we are always looking for more conversations to have here on Good Doctors Diagnose. Let us know what you want. Next week, Next we are week. going to be by popular demand of our own tastes. And, <laughs> uh, several DMs I've gotten. We're going to be talking about Britney Spears and yeah. the most recent amazing miracle that her father has been removed from her conservatorship. Uh-huh. And if you don't know why that's a miracle and an incredible act of actual justice, there is a um, really handy podcast that these two ladies that you may know have just released. Uh, we'll link it in the show notes. Their names are Kristen and Aaron, and they've gone okay. over the Britney Spears case uh, from their entirely non-legal, but entirely passionate feminist perspective. <laughs> and uh, you can listen to that. There's also, as always, no shortage of commentary about the legal side yeah. or cultural side. Um, so next week, we're, we are going to be talking about the the recent Hulu documentary, the recent Netflix documentary, and the recent, um, which included some revelations we have thoughts on with capital T's, as well as the legal stuff. We'll be getting our updates from um, the YouTube legal commentators that we know so that we can uh, head over to you. So next week will be, uh, it's all, it's Brittany bitch. And we are yes. very excited to talk about her, but in the yeah. future, we're planning on maybe doing some more of these good doctors diagnose around themes that where there are documentaries coming out about it. So for example, would you like a good doctor's diagnose on multi-level marketing and the Lulu Row documentary that just came out? Um, there's another option of a really toxic weight loss thing that I did as a child that we can talk about. Um, we're happy to kind of bring a little bit more specific cultural artifacts into good doctors diagnose if that's something you guys would be amenable to yeah uh we're really looking forward to hearing from you about what you want because as always we talk to each other literally all the time all we the time. turn on the cameras for y'all and we uh always want to know what we can serve you with and how we can help you figure things out. And for anybody who's been following us on, on Colonizers World Tour, we promised you that we would figure out what the hell Bitcoin is. We want you to know that we are getting closer to understanding it. <laughs> getting a lot closer. It's taking a Herculean effort on both our parts. Um, we're very thankful to a particular podcast episode, uh, Why is this with Why is this happening? Uh, when Chris Hayes, we're very thankful to... Dr. Kristen's beloved husband, John, for his ability to explain these topics to us uh, in a way, in a language that we understand. Um, so yeah, we might just do like a, a good doctor's guide to Bitcoin. <laughs> to cryptocurrency. The, the, the skeptical idiot's guide to cryptocurrency. <laughs> that, <laughs> that might be us because that's, we are skeptical idiots about this we're a little bit, but we're trying to get idiots. there. I'm not so much of an idiot. I'm still pretty darn skeptical right now. Yeah, yeah. The the it, the skeptical skeptical cryptocurrency for dummies is that the brand of books that? Yeah, maybe yeah. something like that. We'll figure it out. But that's a, an example of something that we are researching in the back end of things that we'd love to tell you guys about if you care and if we can serve you in that way. Yeah, I think that's all we have for today, Doctor Aaron. Anything else? I, I don't have anything. Um, if you want to prep for next week, bring your questions and thoughts and comments. If you also are enthralled by what has happened to Miss Brittany Jean Spears, um, Controlling uh, Brittany is the New York Times documentary on Hulu. It is a follow-up episode to Framing Brittany Spears, which we covered both on our YouTube and podcast. And then uh, Britney versus Spears is the documentary on Netflix, which is like, I was still, I was watching Britney versus Spears this week and it's still like the two of them together put a lot of pieces together, but there's still holes in the story. And I think I titled our GDD for next week, like Britney Spears update colon, why we're even angrier now. <laughs> yeah, honestly. And I, one of the things I will say, we will get into the very nature of conservatorships. Yeah. even more than Brittany herself. Um, there's definitely some things that are specific to Brittany, but in the same way that as we talk about Taylor uh, Swift over the last 20 years, and she is the lens through which we can view feminism. If we talk about Britney Spears over the last 20 years, she's the lens through which we view celebrity. And yeah. there's a lot of, of conversations about parasocial relationships within the free Britney movement 
Um, but also just legitimately that uh, conservatorships are kind of crap. Um, and one of the weird hiccups of the American legal system that we need to be talking about a little bit more. So we're yeah. going to. Exactly. So if we don't see you elsewhere on the YouTubes or the podcasts or the socials, we will see you next Tuesday. We will be in Chicago. We will be together getting ready for the second part of TEDx mania, as I have dubbed this two weeks period of our life. Um, so we'll see you from our hotel room in Chicago. See you guys then. Bye.